Kmart in America as a big retailer said no to enough things that allowed Walmart to pass it. IBM said no to enough things that led Microsoft to happen. And Microsoft said no to enough things that let Google happen. And Google said no to enough things that let Facebook happen. And on and on and on. Attention is the number one asset. What does patience mean to you in a business context? When I think about patience, it makes me smile because it's probably the favorite thing that I talk about to me nowadays because it drives people crazy, especially people that are ambitious and on fire and they associate so much with me because I'm plenty ambitious and plenty on fire. And when I throw out patience, like, wait a minute, you're going off cue. Like, this doesn't sound like you, Gary. And I'm like, that's because you don't realize that there's a different word in the dictionary for patience and complacency. Patience is not complacency. Patience is probably one of the most important ingredients in building something meaningful. Back to building brand, back to other things that I care about like parenting. If patience is not one of your partners, you're dead. You're too short term, you're gonna deviate from the plan and you're probably gonna make a misstep. And more importantly, what really drives me crazy about patience is that most people don't have it, usually for very poor reasons, right? They need to make their bonus in sales this year so they can buy a new boat. They they don't want to do this because they need it now, now, now. They want to build a very big business right now to buy things to impress people that they don't even like. When patience is not at the table, it is almost always associated with a trait that creates a vulnerability in building something meaningful. And so I'm incredibly into patience I think it has been foundational in my happiness both as a human and as an entrepreneur. And I think that some of the most successful businesses of all time, that when you look under the hood and you take away the masks and the facades, you can really see that patience was one of the biggest ingredients. How can I know if my patience is paying off and I'm moving towards my long-term goals? You know, I always hear people say, well, okay, Gary, I'm into patience, I'm building something meaningful in brand. Like, how do I know it's working? And look, I think the answer is results. Like, you know, I don't, I hate going to the gym. I don't think if I didn't see my waist size go down, my weight on the scale, and visually having a little more muscle, if I didn't see that happening, I don't think I would keep doing it. That said, I've been pretty serious about my workout regimen for about a decade now. Exactly, actually 10 years. If you showed me what I look like now, 10 years ago and told me that I worked out almost every day to get to this, I would have been like, that's it? Like, you know, like, I think sometimes we just have too big of a vision. And so, look, I think the way you measure it is measuring what you want to happen. So for example, if you're building a brand for your, for your nonprofit, your charity, right? And you start, and last year you got $88 in donations. I think, and you're doing all the work we're talking about. I think it's appropriate to want $4,000 in donations at the end of the year. And then you go into the next year and it'd be nice if it goes to 15,000 and then 100,000. Like result, we're not trying to avoid results. We just want to look at results more in a one year window than a one day window. And so the way you measure it is the results, donations, sales, you know, the reach and I don't want to say followers because I think the social media game is going away from followers and it's going more to how many people you reach, but the reach, Real metrics, but again, in a one or 18 month or 24 month window, and how do you know it's working? There's indicators. You know, if you're going from $84 in donations to $14,000 in donations in a year, it's happening every day. But you can't be discouraged if you go through 90 days and it's not going well because it's the summer and the kind of people that donate for you are taking off the summer. There's going to be steps backwards along the way, but. I think the results should be part of it, just not too rigid. You've gotta create a little bit of gray in the black and white of how you look at that, but that's how I would look at it. And by the way, back to working out properly, I didn't see any muscle gain for several years, really. It was also a little bit because I needed to put more protein in while I was working out, but that's a different story for a different day, but it's similar to how I think about social media. If you're not doing it right, you're not gonna see results. Just because I believe doing proper social media media and creative is right, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. You have to do it right, hence the details. 
Um, but you know, if you if you're doing the right things, it it's pretty fun to lean into patience because eventually those petals will pop, the rose will bloom, um, and even if not, and I mean this, I want everyone to hear this. Even if not, doing things the right way is the value in itself, and so if you if you lean into patience, you tend to find a lot more success. I've watched way more people fall short because of lack of patience than because of patience. But again, and we brought it up earlier, if you're delusional, you're always vulnerable. Doesn't matter how much patience you deploy. How should I know when to pivot? The how do I know when to pivot question is the hardest one here because the truth is there are millions of people over the last 100 years who quit what they were going for a week before it was gonna tip, which is devastating. Yet, there are equally tens of millions of people who've done the same thing for 30 years and it's never worked for them. And they should have pivoted 14 times along the way. This is not a question I can answer. The truth is no one really knows. There's too many variables. I will say this, the time you should always pivot is when it hasn't been enjoyable for a sustained period of time. If you have not enjoyed your process for the last two years, every day, even if it might be a humbling pill to swallow, even though it might not be fun to hear the judgment of your friends and neighbors when you close up your restaurant, even though you spent five years telling everyone you were gonna crush it. If you haven't enjoyed building it for the last two years, it's time to pivot. There is always a time to pivot. It's called when it's not sustainable anymore, emotionally. By the way, a lot of people should pivot in prosperity. Just because you're making money doesn't mean that you shouldn't pivot. If you are unhappy for a sustained period of time, and everyone's tolerance is different. I throw two years out as an arbitrary number that I feel is like, man, if you've gone 750 days plus really deeply not enjoying what you do every day, regardless of how much money you're making, it's time to pivot. Do you have any tips for leaders who are trying to build the capacity for patience across their organizations? I think when leaders are trying to build patience in organizations, they need to focus on two things. One, fear. Two, bonuses. When you're building an organization, you have to know why people are doing what they're doing. So if you're preaching patience, but you're creating bonuses based on every 30 days how much sales they do, you're talking out of both sides of your mouth and you're a hypocrite. You know, and you may be talking about patience in a different way than sales and that's all fine and you can balance the two things I just said. But please focus on two areas. Bonuses, because all of your employees will go towards that and if you're in a direct conflict of patience, you may want to tweak the bonus structure and the way you give them and what you reward. And two, fear. One of the reasons most people don't have patience is because of fear. They fear failing. And so they try to go fast because if it's not going well, they can't deal with the music, AKA the judgment of the people around them. As a leader, you must navigate and most importantly, eradicate fear at all costs. That doesn't mean accountability because that's required. That doesn't mean a million things. I'm using the word fear. If you weaponize fear or if fear is weaponized in your organization or if fear is in the air in your organization, almost no one will be patient. Patience is in direct conflict with being scared. It's hard to be patient when you're scared. And so please try to eliminate as much fear as possible. How can a company think about the legacy that they're leaving on the world? I'm empathetic that not everyone is as passionate about this as I am. You know, I'm incredibly affected by the belief system that the more you think about leaving a legacy, the more likely your behavior will be good. You know, I think if you care about your reputation in the long term, if you care about leaving a mark, if you care about being 80 or 90 years old and sitting on the porch drinking lemonade, that you're smiling when you tell your war stories or when you see things that are going on in the world knowing you contributed to them, you know, you're gonna care more about legacy. And I don't think everyone thinks that way. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty aware that most people don't think that way. I am arguing and trying to compel people to think about that because if you do, you tend to have a better day-to-day life as well. You have bigger successes, you make more things happen, and so, you know, I think legacy 
and thinking about legacy is incredibly powerful because it's wildly lucrative, both financially, but more importantly, spiritually and emotionally. You know, it's just more fun if you've done bigger things or better things or gone about them in a better way. Uh, you will enjoy that much more. I promise you when you're 91 that you know some 25 year old saying to you that their grandmother said you were this, that, and the other thing and hopefully those this, that, and the other thing are you were kind, you were smart, you were cool, you helped them, you did something in the world, that's enjoyable. And as the world becomes more transparent and it gets harder to hide and everybody knows everything about everybody, I think leaning into legacy is a very good strategy on an individual and on a business level. Why do you think emotional intelligence is so essential for leaders? I'm not even sure how much I even value IQ at all for leaders when we talk about emotional intelligence. I believe EQ is the direct correlation to one's effectiveness. I think it is almost impossible in today's day and age of the consciousness and the spirituality and the conversation and the requirements and the advancements of who we are as humans. I do not believe that your intellect, your IQ, has the ability any longer to be the only thing you rely on as a leader. I just don't think you can. So I think emotional intelligence is the most growing, important variable in the world. And more importantly, when you start going into emotional intelligence and kindness, you have an incredible opportunity to lead an entire organization, country, world, family, into one big game of entitlement, which is incredibly dangerous. So using American politics, so for people around the world, in America we have a red party and a blue party, and I know that's that way in a lot of places. I'm a big believer in purple. I believe there are absolutely attributes from both sides of the way that people see the world as leaders that is a requirement to be successful. I believe that EQ, emotional intelligence, is gonna continue to rise, but I think as we go there, We have to be very thoughtful with our words and our actions to lead to something that's also not delusional, also something that is functional, also something that respects the merit of how the world and humans actually work. And um, I'm excited about it. I'm obsessed with EQ. I agree with you. I think it's the most important skill that any of us can learn, particularly as leaders. Leaders are gonna have to recognize sooner than later that most humans have more options than ever. And unless you're able to trade on emotional intelligence, they're gonna leave. It's just not the way it used to be. No matter how how tough the economy gets, the internet and side hustles and organizations that are leaning into EQ are gonna be too much of a problem for the companies that act like it's the 60s and 70s where you get paid, shut up, is just not going to be a model that works. Now on the flip side, I think most companies today around the world are trying to deal in trying to reel back some of the entitlement that has happened from work from home and things of that nature. So it's a complex time. Um, And I think that's where EQ comes in. One of the most important EQ characteristics that I think is kind candor. You know, I myself am right now tackling as of time of this recording of how I'm going to require more people to come back to the office because it has become incredibly obvious that we are losing efficiencies and it is hurting our organization badly not even kinda. I don't wanna be the old man who walked a mile in the snow and tell everyone you've gotta be in the office every day. At the same token, if we keep going the way we're going, people are gonna have to be let go to make payroll and make our finances anyway, so if I don't tell them the truth, I'm not accomplishing anything anyway. You know, and so there's a, so when I talk about EQ, I think the misconception is it's all warm and fuzzy and rainbows and sunshine, no, no, no. EQ is emotional intelligence. And delivering candor in a way that's effective and lands well, very difficult. And so, you know, exciting times for all us leaders. More more pressure than ever, harder than ever. But you don't get to choose when you're born. For the fact that it was easier to run a company in 1940, cool, but there was a lot of other things going on in 1940 that were not easier. And so, We often navigate our times, but yeah, I do think emotional intelligence is now a prerequisite to be an effective leader in 2023. Four, five, six, seven, eight, 2030 and beyond.
How can I pair the idea of kind candor with giving good feedback? Good feedback is grounded, in my opinion, in kindness and humility and candor. You know, we call it kind candor in my companies. I've been thinking about changing it to kind and humble candor, and let me explain why. We've, we've turned a major corner in our organization with kind candor. It is a rallying cry that people can wrap their heads around. I'm about to leave or lead or have a communication with someone that may not be that easy, where I'm going to tell them that it's not going well. Um, and I'm going to try to do that with kindness. Little sugar with the medicine in the old days, and it's been effective. The problem is, as I analyze it in its current form, and not only in my organization but others, is people still leave confused. Because bosses, even though they can say it kindly, will say, hey, you just haven't hit the mark yet. And you ask them what the mark is. And what we are not accepting as leaders is that these are subjective opinions often. So I just had a meeting today where I told a very senior leader I really want your leaders, when they give feedback, to say nicely, kind. I want them to say, in my subjective opinion, you are not working hard enough. You are not playing nice enough with the other boys and girls. The quality of your writing is not good. By saying, in my subjective opinion, you're adding a layer of humility, which makes the constructive criticism more productive because it no longer is it absolute and gray. It is not absolute, focus group subjective of one, but clear that I am telling you that in my opinion, and unfortunately it is my job to make this subjective opinion as your manager, that you are not hitting the mark on this, but that doesn't mean you're not a good person and let's keep talking in this meeting to figure out how to close the gap on my subjective opinion, but I, leave, but I believe most managers and leaders are not deploying the humility needed in a meeting to make it about their subjective opinion. They're treating it as if it's absolute truth and yes, it may be absolute truth because it's their business or they're the manager, but I think hedging it with the subjectiveness and letting that person know it's your subjective opinion takes a little steam out of it and, and makes it more constructive. I think the way to have a constructive feedback session is by making the person feel safe and good. And I would argue almost all the meetings that are being had are making people feel scared and not great. As a leader, what other actions do you think I should take to show empathy and care and to make it felt within my organization? I believe that general kindness and warmth are able to deliver on these things. For example, you know, before you get into a sit down session where you might have to give some critical feedback even though you're trying to do it kind and humbly, you know, grabbing someone and taking a walk around the block and telling them what you're, you know, hey, you're starting to see some early signals that are concerning you and don't do this mistake that I've seen others and like getting to things early um, and just genuine things like wishing people a happy birthday, you know, putting your hand on their shoulder if you're noticing that they're having a bad day, if you're sensing that they're off, you know, doing a random act of kindness, um, being overly gracious when someone's over delivering for you. Like when somebody worked 18 hours over the weekend to get the thing done, you know, not just doing the cliche, maybe a card or, you know, A, just even first acknowledging it, but B, maybe doing something out of your way, or see the reverse. This is why emotional intelligence matters. You don't wanna just reward people going out of their way with tangible things all the time either. You know, maybe just conversations. I may say to someone like, hey, I'm not gonna send you uh, some chocolates or a video game because you went hard this weekend because remember the last three months when you've been like kind of having half days? Like it's pretty cool that we can have each other's back where you've got my back when it might be an intense moment and I'm giving you a little freedom when it's not an intense, like just being human. It sounds obvious, but it's so hard to do. Corporate environments are almost impossible to be human in, unfortunately. And that is the number one thing I want to eradicate before I'm off this world. I'd like to change two things. One, the definition of success. It cannot be just about financial. It needs to be about peace of mind and happiness and being content and joyous. 
And number two, how we act in work environments. It blows my mind that people think it's okay to cry at work. We must eliminate tears in the workplace. It can't be, it's just work. It can't be that serious. And I, by the way, on the record, there's not many people that, of the eight billion that has more pride and more enjoyment and more care about work than me, but we still must contextualize that in the world. And I think people lead with fear too much. And I think the reason people cry too much is because their bosses have weaponized that fear in that moment to make that person think that they're gonna lose their job. And we must stop that behavior. How would you describe the attitudes that one should bring to emerging technologies like generative AI or emerging platforms? Somebody asked me the other day about why I've had such a successful career. And my answer is, because I love maybe. And she had a perplexed face and then I dug into it. And that is my answer to how I think about technology. I believe the far majority of people in the world, when faced with a new technology, throw up an enormous no sign. No, they don't want to be on the internet. No, they do not want a pager. No, do they not want a mobile phone. No, do they want a Blackberry. No, do they want to switch to iPhone. No, do they want to open a Facebook account, Twitter. On and on and on and on. And I remind all of you, which is most of you who are watching this, most of the things you say no to, you eventually have to say yes to because it's how the world works. So no matter how hard you tried to not have a smartphone because you didn't want the internet following you around because it was enough that the internet was at home, you now have that. And on and on and on and on. And so I believe with AI, we're seeing some of the most aggressive no ever. You know, I want to remind people that when social media first hit the scene, MySpace, most of the mainstream media told you to not let your kids on MySpace because they would get kidnapped at the mall by somebody who they met on MySpace. This is real. I believe that right now we're in a 3.0 version of that conversation with AI. Everyone's like, AI is bad. And by the way, there are many things that are bad about AI or potentially bad. The fact that deep fake videos are gonna be prevalent all over the internet is bad. The fact that there are videos of me in five years saying a million things I've never said and you won't be able to tell if it's a real video or not, that's bad. It's bad because we're gonna have to reset the world from believing video. For the last hundred years, we believe video. I would argue that video proof has been the judge and jury of society. I get that we're gonna have to adjust, but guess what? We always adjust. Video has not been around forever. And so we always adjust. And so, you know, I think this relationship I have with new technologies of maybe has been very powerful. Every time I look at something, I say maybe. I saw Bitcoin in 2013. I said maybe. I bought a couple, I lost them, but I bought them. And it didn't mean that I thought Bitcoin was gonna change the world then, but maybe it might. And there's been social networks, Vine, Social Cam, Plurk, uh, all sorts of things that people don't remember, Peach, um, all these different apps that I spent time on because it was maybe and it didn't manifest in growth. But when I said maybe to YouTube eight weeks after YouTube came out, that worked out for me. And there was millions that said no. And so I beg everyone to not just demonize because AI is going to be the technology that saves a lot of people's lives when finding cancer that the best doctor in the world couldn't find. Or just like the tractor trailer was demonized because it took people's jobs from farms because now a trailer could do it instead of people. What happened was people found new things they could do. And the reason we as humans continue to advance into more complex forms is because we keep inventing technologies that find and buy us time to be able to do more things. AI is gonna be the single technology that enables almost every single person that's watching this to spend more time with their family before they die. You know how great that is? So yes, I'm obsessed with maybe. I believe that people are way too into no. And I believe maybe, by the way, is not just a good framework for technology. I think it's a good framework for life. And uh, I'm a champion of maybe. As a business leader, how can I learn to embrace or learn to love maybe? Well, as a business leader, the reason I think you're gonna 
learn to embrace maybe is because the market's not gonna give you any choice. Everybody who's obsessed with no goes out of business. Let me say that really slow. One more time for all the kids in the back. Every business leader that obsesses and puts no on a pedestal goes out of business eventually. No means you're not doing anything. (laughs) It means you're doing yesterday. And unfortunately, that's just not how the world works. Tomorrow comes. Kmart in America as a big retailer said no to enough things that allowed Walmart to pass it. IBM said enough things, said no to enough things that led Microsoft to happen. And Microsoft said no to enough things that let Google happen. And Google said no to enough things that let Facebook happen. And on and on and on. And I believe no is is poison for long-term growth and, and happiness. And so I, I highly recommend people get off the no train. Because what's fun about maybe is you can end up in no. I go to no a lot, but it is always after maybe. Let me also say on the record, the predominant joy of my life has been based on the yeses I've said after maybe. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to talk about? In closing, one of the things I would love to talk about is taking this up, and we've been, I've been pretty heady here because the format allowed me to, but to take it up even heavier and even headier. As you wrap up watching this video, I hope the thematics can trickle into every aspect of your life, can actually spur some deeper conversations with yourself. I think about this a lot. We are not born for a very long time. I don't know if you know this, but a lot has happened in the world before the day you were born. You're also dead forever. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but once you die, you're pretty much dead. And that's that. So this little tiny window, this tiny window, God willing, 100 years for the people that are watching with modern medicine, this tiny window that you get to play, please don't mail it in take the thematics of this talk and deploy it to not just your content or your marketing strategies or even your business. Deploy it to your life. You know, there is so much joy and I'm not confused. Listen, the thing I most pride myself in is I am not overly ideological or delusional. Um, I'm aware that there's a lot going on in the world. I'm also very good at history and I beg you to look back at the world the last 50, 100, 200, and 300 years I think you can argue very quickly that this is the greatest era to be alive. That doesn't mean we don't have major issues. We will always have that. It's the flight of the human. But I ask you to take this video, this energy, and really ask yourself important questions. Are you fighting for the right things? Are you caring for others? And most of all, are you caring for yourself, which will then allow you to care for others? And I think going through that game and going through that framework and using the thematics that we talked about in this around marketing and business and deploying them to your life will A, help you be better at marketing and business, but more importantly, it'll help you be a better father, mother, sister, brother, child, human in our society and and I wish that for you because I'll leave you with, try to find some time to spend with 70, 80, 90 year olds that aren't your grandparents. We underestimate, we've, we've done a really good job in the world the last 20 years putting youth on a pedestal, visually and technology wise but I think we've lost our way and we don't respect our elders enough anymore. And I don't think we're extracting the value out of the 80 and 90 year olds in the world. Go spend an hour with a 90 year old that isn't your grandparent. I promise you're gonna leave that meeting in a different way and, and I hope this energy inspires you to maybe tweak a couple things to make the future more joyous and impactful.